Okay, so now I'm going to introduce Juan Melendez. You've heard a, a lot about his case already, so I won't go into detail on that. Since being freed, Juan has traveled the globe to tell the story of his journey from hope to freedom. Juan was the 99th death row prisoner in the United States to be released based on evidence of innocence since 1973. He's a board member of an organization called Witness to Innocence. You'll see the t-shirt in a minute. And uh, while I mention that, let me thank Witness to Innocence for co-sponsoring this event. And while I mention that, let me thank the other co-sponsors. Um, the Department of Criminology, Law and Society, the School of Social Ecology, the School of Law, the Center for Psychology and Law, the Forum for the Academy in Public Life, Literary Journalism, and the Department of Criminology, Law and Society's Race and Justice Initiative. Um, Juan's story is, uh, has become very well known. It's depicted in the internationally acclaimed documentary Juan Melendez 6446, which is a reference to the number of days that he was um, incarcerated, and in the One for Ten series that you just saw. And some of you may know the Eggers and Volan book about wrongful convictions. Juan's case is featured in that as well, um, by Dave Eggers and Lola Volan. Uh, what surviving justice it's called. Um, Juan has also testified before various legislative bodies in New Hampshire, New Jersey, Maryland, New York, and New Mexico. So uh, without further ado, Juan Melendez. Thank you. thank you, thank you. Can everybody hear me? Yep. Okay. Uh, before I start, I want to Thank God for keeping me alive for all this time. I want to thank all of you for being here. I want to thank everybody that in, was involved in making this event come, come true. My name is Juan Roberto Melendez. I'm the number 99 person in the nation to be exonerated and liberated from death row for a crime I did not commit. But my story is not that all unique. It's 150 of us. It's so many of that we, own, we, all, we already have an organization named Witness to Innocent. It's an organization that helps us, train us, and teach us how to speak. And, and, in the, and the, we have galleries together and help us go out and do this work, plan to abolish the death penalty. It also has been 1,392 plus executions, many of them in the state of Texas. They are real cowboys down there. And only God knows how many of them didn't have the luck that I had in the rest of the 149. As I tell my story, you feel like crying, cry. If you feel like laughing, please laugh. I love smiling faces. The only favor I answer all of you is this. Please don't fall asleep on me. <laughs> it was a beautiful day. I never forgot it. It was on a Monday, May the 2nd, 1984. While my co-workers and I was eating lunch under an apple tree, we hear noise in the orchards that did not belong to the orchards, but eight police cars right in the hills, FBI agents. And they stopped in front of us. And they came out of the car pulling weapon at us. And they told us to hit the ground. And we did. Then they called my name. But I was scared to get up because of the weapon that was pointing at me. But I raised my arms. Then they told me to get up and walk out with them. And I did. When I got in front of them, they told me to open my mouth. They wanted to see if I had a missing tooth. I showed it to them. Today, I fixed them. <laughs> and I'm still working on them. Then they told me to roll the sleeve of my shirt from my left arm. They wanted to see if I had a tattoo. And I showed it to them. Then they say, yes, you are the man we are looking for. You are wanted for unlawfully fly to avoid prosecution with warrants for your arrest for first degree murder and armed robbery in the state of Florida. So they, they read me some rights and they slapped some handcuffs on me and they throw me in a police car and they took me to a federal prison. A week or so after that, they took me to court in front of a, in front of a magistrate a federal judge, and he was talking about extradition. But I did not know what extradition mean. I was naive to the law, naive to the language. 
This is the type of English I know at that time. If I say five words in English, my friends, believe me, my friends, three of them would be cuss words. <laughs> so they brought interpreted to me to explain to me what extradition mean. And he told me in Spanish, all he told me in Spanish was this, you either wave it or fight it. They're going to take you back anyway. So I, I start thinking, I'm not a killer. My mama did not raise no killers. I would wave it, and as soon as they see this ugly face in Florida, they would let me go. But how wrong I was. So I waved extradition, and there is the diamond from the state of Pennsylvania all the way back to the state of Florida. A week or so after my arrival, they took me to court in front of a judge, and he was reading the charges to me. You've been indicted, arrested for first degree murder, and I'm robbery, and the state of Florida is sinking the death penalty against you, the electric chair. A week or so after that, they took me right back to court with the same judge. This time to court upon a lawyer for me, a public defender. The truth is, I'm not O.J. Simpson. I don't have money to hire lawyers. So this public defender comes to me, and I cannot hardly understand what he's saying because they never gave me an interpreter. But he used to pat me in the back and tell me that everything is going to be all right. You're going home. I did understand that going home stuff. I should go home. I did not commit the crime. So now we go on a trial. Monday, we start picking the jury. Tuesday, we still picking jury. And after they pick 11 whites, one African-American person, a black man, and no Hispanic, and I'm Hispanic, they read the instruction to the jury how they conduct themselves in a capital murder case with the sinking, the death penalty. Wednesday, that's when the evidence come in. And this is what they had against me. They have what they call a police informant. What they call in the streets a snitch. He claimed that I confessed the crime to him. The same police informant, the same snitch, also implicates a friend of mine in the crime. He gets arrested. He's interrogated. He makes 15 statements. He incriminates himself in the crime. He gets charged with it. First degree murder, I'm robbery. And they threaten him with the electric share. It's time to make a deal. You see, prosecutors in the United States, they make deals with criminals. So he was able to strike a deal with the state. He gets his first degree murder charge dropped. He gets his armed robbery charge dropped all the way to accessory after the facts. No more threats to the electric chair. He gets two years probation. With two years, he already had. And basically what he's saying in trial was this. I picked him up, took him to the scene of the crime, dropped him off, came back an hour and a half later, picked him up again, took him home, don't know what happened to after it happened. That's the entire evidence against me. No physical evidence against me. That's the testimony of two questionable witnesses with a criminal record from coast to coast. Two questionable witnesses that make deals with the state, deals with the prosecutor. And they get lenity, rewards for their own crimes they commit. This is what I had on my favor on the defense side. I have what you call an alibi witness. I had all the witnesses testifying saying that the police informant, the snitch, had a grunt against me. But I had a problem. Every witness that I had on my side was from the African-American race, a black man, a black woman. And when a black man and a black woman testify for the state, for the prosecutor, all of a sudden they got good credibility. They even dressed them. I never saw my co-defender with a three-piece suit on. I never saw my court defender with a clean shave in the streets. They used to call him the wolf. But when a black man and a black woman testified for the defense on my side, all of a sudden, the credibility is gone. Thursday, they found me guilty. Friday, the very next day, they sent me to death. And the judge complained that it was taking too long. When they sent me to death, my heart got full of hate. Hated the prosecutor. Hated the judge. Hated the juror. And I hated that one that pat me in the back, my trial defense lawyer, 
because I failed. He betrayed me. But above all, I thought we Puerto Rican men was real macho men. I found out different. I was scared, very scared to die for a crime I did not commit. So now I'm going to death row. And this was the ugly day. I never forgot it. It was on a Tuesday, November the 2nd, 1984. The place was horrified. It was dark. It was cold. They keep in a six by nine foot cell. And every time they move me out of that cell for whatever reasons, I got shackles in my legs, chains in my waist, and heckles in my wrists. The place was also infected with rats and roaches. So they throw me down in the bottom floor. 17 condemned the, the rope prisoners in the bottom floor. 17 in the second one, 17 in the third. And I made the 248 men condemned to death in the state of Florida, since they restated the death penalty in the nation in 1976. The food. They put the food in the car, and they wheeled that car in, in the floor, in the wing where you're at. And breakfast, oh, that's the worst one. But not because of the food. I love grits and eggs. It's because they come real early, and they never wake you up. And if you wait five seconds, and you bunk to get up and get that tray of breakfast, Forget about it. You ain't read out of luck. You see, the roaches and beat you too. They waiting for the breakfast too. And it get cold in northern Florida. And the suppliers with a thin blanket. And I take that blanket and I cover my from foot, face, and all. I don't want to see nothing. But the rats, they also get cold. And they want to get warm. So they climb that blanket. And I can feel that rat that's running up and down. And I don't want to look at them, because if I look at them, I'm not going to be able to sleep. But when that rat stays still in my chest, and he's not moving, I get a good grip of the blanket, and I shake it hard as I can. I can hear that rat hit the floor. Boom! It's a big one. So I arrive over there on a Tuesday. Not that Thursday. The following Thursday, they executed the 10 pairs in the state of Florida. When I leave that place, 51, today, 90, and still counting. But when they secured that 10 person, I got super scared. You see, I do not know the language that well. I do not know the process. I'm lost in there. So the thoughts in my mind is this. They're killing people here every week. How long is going to be before they get me? So I know how to box. And I know all this exercise. You can keep your muscle flexible, and you can defend yourself. So I'm thinking, if they come over here, I'm just going to fight them. And I walk into that chair. When I think about it, I'm scared of electricity anyway. So I had to come up with a plan. I take the cheese on my bone, and I cut it all in pieces. And I, make, and I take these pieces, and I make little ropes with it. And I take these little ropes, and I tie the cell door bars. You see? The cell door bars slide like this. I tie this end. When they push the button in that control room, that door is moving nowhere. <laughs> so I'm thinking, by the time they cut all these ropes all, all up, I can give me a good warm up. And when they come over here, I'm just going to fight them. So now I'm doing exercise. It's around count time, and I'm sweating real good. I'm trying to make muscles come out of my eyebrows. You see, I'm trying to scare these people. I'm trying to intimidate these people. But all the time, I'm the one intimidated. I'm the one scared. So it's around count time. They count us every hour. And here comes this correction office. It's a big, tall African-American person, a big black man. He had muscles in his eyebrows. <laughs> so when he gets in front of that door, and you see the door so tied up, he gets angry. And he starts cursing. Melendez, why you got the goddamn door so tied up? And he cursed and cursed and cursed and cursed. I do not know too much English, but I know how to curse. So in a very, very, very bad way, 
I remind him of his mother, father, all the way down. <laughs> so now me in this Korean office, we just cussing each other out. And the rest of the condemned men to death, they got involved in the argument. But to my surprise, it's against me. They tell me that I'm wrong. So now I get angry with them. And I try to tell them the best way I can. I know they're killing people here every week. And we ain't doing nothing. We're supposed to fight these people. We're supposed to burn the place down. We Puerto Ricans don't go out like that doing nothing. We fight. They still told me that I was a fool. They told me that I was crazy. They told me that all I do is get up in the morning and go to the cell door bars and nag and curse and cry about my innocence. Then they told me that I did not know how to read. I did not know how to write. And I did not know how to speak English. Then they told me the most beautiful thing I could hear that time. They told me they will teach me. The worst of the worst. The most indesirable and hated people in the nation. They wanted some prosecutor called monsters. Told this Puerto Rican how to read, how to write, how to speak English. And they would never taught me. I would never survive that place. I want to be able to communicate better with my lawyers. I want to be able to reply the letter that so many pen pals wrote me. Some of them for this great state of California that show me so much love, so much compassion, that make me feel like a human being. And today, I will not be able to share with all of you this sad story. I spent 17 years, eight months, and one day in Florida death row for a crime I did not commit. After 10 years, I was tired of it. I want out of there. But the only way out is to commit suicide. And believe me, last of my friends committed suicide. And I'm going to tell you how they do it. They got what they call a runner. A runner is an inmate that's doing time in prison population. He's not sentenced to death. And they get this runner, this inmate at the prison population, so he can do the work in the death row place. You see, the correction officers, they don't do nothing. All they do is watch you. And some of them give you a hard time when they can. This runner, this inmate, that's not sent it to death. He is the one that supplies us with the food, the toothbrush, the toothpaste, the mop in the room so you can clean yourself. He can also supply you with a tool that you can take your life with, and he knows it. All you got to do is give him four post stamps or a package here rolling paper tobacco, the cheap kind, and he will give you this tool. Perhaps he do it because this item that I just mentioned are more important to him than your life. Or perhaps he do it because he called himself assisting you, helping you. He works there. He know you want out of there. He know that their row is hell. The two is real simple. It's a garbage plastic bag. The one you see in the garbage can, the strong kind. You give him four stamps and when the guard is looking, he will swing that bag inside your cell. You take that bag, you twist it all up and you make a rope. Then you put a noose in it. You put the noose in your neck, and you tie the other ends in the cell door bars. You throw yourself down. You're dead, but you're free. That's what the demons used to tell me. Why? Why you got to go through all of this? You're supposed to be a Puerto Rican man, a real macho man. Don't satisfy them. Satisfy yourself. You said you didn't do it. You think they're going to believe you? They're going to kill you. Anyway, so grab that bag and that thoughts stay in my mind. I never see my friends kill themselves because I cannot see through the walls. But I always see when they wheel the body out. You see, something in the back of my head tells me, you're not gonna look at your friend for the last time? 
So I have a mirror in my cell. I grab it. I take it and I stretch my arms to the box with it and I look and this is what I see. I see a purple blue face that do not look like my friend. I get to see something else too. I get to see the noose in his neck because they never take it out and, and that stay in my mind. So now I want to take this trip. You see, I'm tired of it. I want out of there. I'm depressed. So I tell the runner, give me, give me, give me that garbage bag. So I give him four stance and when the guy wouldn't look him, he swing that bag inside myself. I take that bag and I twist it around and I made a rope. Then I put a noose in it. Then I look at my bunk and I look at the rope and I say to myself, I better lay down and think about this a little bit more. <laughs> so I grab that rope that is made to take my life with. And I throw it under the bunk. So when the guys walk by, they don't see it. And I lay down. When I lay down, I fell in a deep, deep, deep sleep. And I start dreaming. Then I'm a little kid again. Doing the things I used to do when I was a little kid. The things that make me happy. The things that make me smile. You see, I was born in Brooklyn, New York. But I was raised in the island of Puerto Rico. They took me back when I was just a little kid. So when I look at the east side, it's a wonderful mountain. And if I walk six minutes toward the south, I find myself in the most beautiful beach in the world. It is to me. So here I am, dreaming, then I'm swimming in the beautiful Caribbean Sea. The water is warm. The sun is so bright. The sky is so blue. The palm trees look so good. It's a beautiful day. Then I get to see something that I never saw before. Four dolphins coming my way. And they pass me. Then they turn around. And a pair got on one side. And a pair got on another side. And they start flipping and jumping like dolphins do. I'm having a ball in there. I'm so happy. Then I look to the shore, and it's a beautiful lady waving at me, smiling at me, and she seems so happy. And I know why she is happy. She's happy because I'm happy. That's my dear mother. And then I wake up. When I wake up, they don't smell like a beach. So I grab that rope that I just made to take my life with. And I go straight to the toilet with it. And I look at the rope. And I look at the toilet. And I say real loud, I don't want to die. And I flush it. But the true fact is, it was lots and lots and lots of beautiful dreams. Every time I got depressed, every time I went out of there, every time suicide thoughts came to my mind, I would create God, send me a beautiful dream. And I was wise enough to grab all them dreams as a sign of hope that one day I will be out of there. I will be free, like God was telling me. Hey, I know you didn't do it, but I control the time. You get out. When I said you get out, you just got to trust me. When I analyze everything, I come to one conclusion. It took 17 years, eight months, and one day to also change the man. The death penalty. The death penalty is a law made by human beings and carried out by human beings. We all know, we humans, we make mistakes. The death penalty is also a law that brings a lot of suffering, a lot of, lot of pain on both sides of the families, on the family victims of homicides, and the family of the woman and man that's condemned to death. What family is concerned, this is all I had. Mama and five aunts. Oh, uh, I got brothers. I got sisters. I got uncles. I got lots of cousins. But they never wrote me a letter. Mama and five aunts. I do not know how the aunts are 
in this generation. But in my generation, when I was growing up, if my aunt caught me doing something wrong, believe me, my friends, it's going to be a good ass whooping. And then I got to get on my knees and pray to God that she don't tell mama. Because when she tell mama, it's going to be another good ass whooping. But when I was hungry, my aunts always feed me. When I needed clothes, my aunts always bought it for me. And in their role, they never forgot me. They wrote me lots and lots and lots of letters. They sent me lots and lots of pictures, photos of the one that born and I never seen. And I saw all of them grow up to pictures. They believe in keeping the family together. And mama, I have to tell you, I believe she suffered more than anybody. She also wrote me lots and lots of letters that gave me so much hope and helped me keep the will to live. But it's one letter that I keep with me all the time. And when I'm down and out, sad and weak, I read it. And it always boosts me up. And it go like this. She wrote and say, son, I just built an altar. In that altar, I put the statue of the Virgin of the Guadalupe in it. And I call roses. And I put it in it. And I pray three rosaries a day, sinking, searching, looking for a miracle. And that miracle will come soon. Because I know you're innocent. And God knows that you're innocent. But you had to put, you had to put all your trust in God. And, and one day, he will send you free. 17 years. Eight months and one day later, the miracle, miracle came through. Thank you, God, but it took too long, God. And this I found out a week or so after I've been out. I went to my mama's room, and I noticed that tears was running down her cheeks. And I said, Mama, what's wrong? And she said, Son, in spite that all that faith and hope that I have in the vision of the Guadalupe and God for all them years, for all them long, long, long years, I was saving money to bring your dead body back to the island of Puerto Rico in the state of Florida where had execute you. And no mother in this world to go to that pain. The hardest thing for me in Devro was when they execute someone. When the government legally kills. You see, I'm in this cell. Next to me is another person condemned to death that I know for 10, 15 years, maybe more. He cries in my shoulders. I cry in his. He shared with me his most intimate thoughts. And I share mine with him. I learned to grow to love him. And one day they snatch him out of that cell. And I know what's going to happen. They're going to kill him. And I cannot stop it. My time is the electric chair. And they got to generate the chair with electricity. Because it's 2010 boats that got to go through his body in order to get him killed. And I can hear this bossy sound. Uh, 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 that's still in my mind. And I know precisely the time when they burned the life out of him. Because the lights flip on and off. And I cannot stop it. And believe me, some of them are innocent. Like Jesse Tefaro, Benny Dems. Leo Jones, Pedro Medina, and my homeboy from Puerto Rico that on a legally plea bargain, the state of Florida offered him five years. He did not took it simply because he did not commit the crime. And it cost him his life, Angel Nieves Diaz. And all I can say is this, I'll see you soon. But 
an awful sad stories. Let me tell you how I got out of there. And I tell you right from the jump, I was not saved by the system. I was saved in spite of the system. I was saved by the grace of God. Miracles. Some people call it luck. I call it a miracle. Here comes my turning with tears running down her cheeks. And she tells me, Juan, I cannot handle your case no more. And I say, why, Miss Gail? You know my case better than anybody. I don't need no new lawyers now. And she said, you know why? I lost five clients. They are your friends. And no mistake when she say she lost five clients. It's five, five human beings that the government of Florida legally kill, executed. If you're going, if you're going to become a criminal lawyer, which I wish you will, we need you. Be carefully with the death penalty cases. They can get to you. So my lawyer tells me that, don't worry about it. She, she said, I will, I will get the agency to assign the three best lawyers they have and the best investigator. One of them is right here, Ms. Rosa Greenball. I finally got the dream team. <laughs> so here comes my new lawyer. And he tells me, Melendez, you have lost too many appeals. I say, tell me something new. Then he say, but we're going to try one more time. But if you lose this one, you'll be lucky if you live three years. I say, if I lose this one, I'll be lucky if I live a year and a half. You know who the government of Florida is. He will have no problem in signing my death warrant. So this, his strategy was to send the investigator out to see my trial defense lawyer, the one that used to pat me in the back. And the first miracle occurred. My trial defense lawyer just became a judge. And I thank God for that. You see, by him becoming a judge, he creates in the legal world a conflict of instruments. And that conflict of instruments gave me the opportunity to move my case out of the racist county, out of the county where they fabricated the case against me, out of the county where the good old boy network operates. And it moves from Balto, Paul County, Florida. And by the way, please don't go over there. <laughs> it moves to Hillsborough County, Tampa, Florida. And it falls in the hands of a courageous, brave woman. A woman that wants to do the right thing. Her name is George Honorable Barbara Fletcher. I can sincerely say, without hesitating, I owe that beautiful lady my life. So going back to the story when my investigator going to see my trial defense lawyer, who just became a judge, he tells her, I'm a judge now. I have a new office. But in the old office where I used to do my defense work, I believe it's a box in there with the name Melendez Ronnie on it. You can go there and have it. So she rushed over there, found that box, went inside, dug out a tape cassette, play it. Guess what? The confession of the real killer was in that tape cassette. And my trial defense lawyer, the one who used to pat me in the back, who just became a judge, had it one month before trial. He's open a can of wounds now. The case in the hand of a brave woman that wants to do the right thing. After Honorable Barbara Fletcher heard, heard the take confession of the real killer, she immediately made a court order to the prosecution office and demanded he send any papers, any notes, any documents of the case. He had, he had it to do so, and he did. Guess what? He had a transcript, a copy of the take confession of the real killer. He also had it one month before trial. But he has something else too. He has sitting documents that corroborated the take confession of the real killer. Sitting documents that he never turned in to trial defense lawyer at the time of the trial was created in the legal world. A Brady rule violation. We're holding escapatory evidence. Evidence that indicate that you did not commit the crime. By that time I already had three eventuality hearings. 
and I was able to establish more than 20 witnesses that also corroborated the take confession of the real killer, including the wife and sister of the real killer, including law enforcement officers, former prosecuting investigator, former FBI agent, if criminal lawyers, friends of the real killer. In the end, I think they even found physical evidence against the real killer. The real killer was also a police informant. So now, Honorable Barbara Fletcher got all this ammunition and decided to write a 72-page opinion on it. In that 72-page opinion, she chastised the prosecutor for the way he handled the case. She chastised law investigators for the way they investigated the case. And she chastised the man that patted me in the back, my trial defense lawyer, for the way he called himself, defended me. And she ordered me, granted me a new trial. And she let it know that the case was terrible damage, implying you have an innocent man in death row. The prosecutor decided not to process the case, dismiss the case, drop the case. And that's why I'm here, thank God, talking to all you now. I never know the time and date this, they was going to release me. It caught me totally by surprise. They put shackles in my legs, changed in my waist, and handcuffs in my wrist. And they took me to a place they called the information room. It's not that far where the death penalty place is. They sent me in a chair. In front of me is a desk. Behind the desk is a lady working on computers. And she started making some stupid, naive questions. She asked me for my social security number. I gave it to her. I know it by heart, and I wonder why. Then she came up with so more stupid, naive questions. Where you working at? What type of job you have? Who you working for? I must give her a real look. Because she got up the chair she was sitting on and put both hands in the desk that was in front of me. And she looked straight in my eyes and she said, Melendez, you do not understand what's going on in here, do you? I say, lady, I don't have the slightest idea. I live across the streets. I've been in there for almost 18 years. I'm in death row. They don't have no jobs in death row. <laughs> then she came real close to me, almost whispering in my ears. And she say, we are fixing your paperwork. They're going to release you today. And I do not know if you watch cartoons. And you see this cartoon character. He takes a slot hammer. He's the only one inside the head with a boom. And you can see that knot that's come straight up. Then he have a ring star that's going around his head. He's in a state of shock, but he's smiling. That's how I was. In a state of shock, but smiling. And I'm still smiling today. Then the correction officer, they start acting different. They offer me sandwiches and soda pops. <laughs> I don't want no sandwich. I don't want no soda pop. I want to go back to my cell, pack everything up, and get the hell out of here. <laughs> then I had to take physicals. And I never seen these people work so fast. I was first for everything. They're moving everybody out of the way. Then they start calling me something they never called me before. They start calling me Mr. Melendez. And I liked that. <laughs> so now I'm in the cell, packing everything up. And I want to say goodbye to my friend in the last cell. And I'm in the cell next to last. I got tears running down my cheeks. I got a smile in my face. But when I got in front of him, I could not say nothing. It hit me. I was happy, but part of me still was sad because I leave them behind. The ones that told me how to read, how to write, how to speak English, and such a stint, how to let hate and anger go. And I know the destiny if we do not abolish the death penalty, they will kill them all. He had tears running down his cheeks. He had a smile on his face, but he was able to talk. And the first word that came out of his mouth was this, like this. Don't get in no trouble there. <laughs> then he said, take care of yourself. Then he said, don't forget about us. And the last word was, take care of your mama. They all know my mama. This friend of mine that shared these kind words with me before I left, 
His name is Clarence Hills. Unfortunately, on a Wednesday, September the 20th, 2007, he was executed. May God rest his soul. So there's about every one of them was telling me the same thing. And before I get to that door that gonna leave me out of that floor, out of that wing, I hear a clap. Then I hear a second clap and a third clap. They was making so much noise, clapping their hands, banging the bars and whistling that the correction officer got angry with them, told them to shut up, to be quiet. Then, then stopped making noise to a left that place. They was real happy to see me go. So now I'm in the door that will lead me to freedom. And when they opened this door, they said, what I saw? I saw a whole bunch of reporters. NBC, CBS, PBS, BBC. The whole letters of the alphabet was in there. <laughs> and no offense, no disrespect. Reporters sometimes make some stupid, silly questions. <laughs> the first one was, how do you feel? <laughs> I feel happy. I'm going home. Then come this female reporter with some more crazy questions. Where are you going? What you gonna do? What you wanna see? I did not tell her that I wanna go to Disney World. <laughs> I told her and it came naturally, it came from my heart and they wrote it down this like I told her. I told her that I wanna see the moon. I wanna see the stars. I wanna walk on grass, on dirt. I want to hold a little baby in my arm and, and play with him. Of course I told her. I want to talk to some beautiful woman. <laughs> that reporter I had in front of me, she was ugly. <laughs> but that's a joke and my luck. I miss the things we take for granted, the simple things in life. I cannot understand the people in the free world when they tell me they're bored. When God has created so many things for us that we can enjoy, take care, love, and share. So many good deeds, so many good choices we can make in life. And in speaking about good deeds and making good choices in life, I have a confession to make. I'm still a dreamer. Mm -hmm. I dream and I pray to God every day that in my time I can see the death penalty abolished. But this dream cannot come true if all of you don't get involved in it. You are part of my dream now. You see, the problem with the death penalty is all about details, education. People need to know that is racist. People need to know it do not deter crime. People need to know that it costs too much. People need to know that is cruel and unnecessary. We had alternatives. People need to know, and this is the best thing they need to know is this. Alone in this great state of California have it. Any state, any nation, any country, it always will be a risk to execute an innocent one. And we can always release an innocent man from prison. We don't have no problems with that. But we can never, and I repeat, we can never release an innocent man from the grave. And that's like we got rid of se segregation. And that's like we abolished slavery. White, black, and brown together in harmony. We can get rid of the madness of the death penalty. So please, join me in my dream. Let's get the death penalty abolished in the United States and the entire world. I love you. Peace and love to you all. Thank you. 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 Thank you.